You are listening to the voice of the frontline protector here at the Private Officer Beat Radio. Every week, you'll hear breaking news, topics of training, information for the industry of security, public safety, and law enforcement. So strap in, hang on, we're about to speed off in this episode of the Private Officer B Radio. You're listening to the Private Officer Beat Radio, a production of Blue Ram Media Group and Private Officer International. Private Officer International is a security and law enforcement organization founded in 2002. Today's program is going to be just packed full of information and industry news, and of course, at the bottom of the show, we'll be talking about a training topic or informational topic that I think you'll find um, helpful, interesting, and that's what our show is all about. I'm your host, Rick McCann. Glad that you are joining us on this 23rd day of May 2022. Of course, we also have a lot of breaking news to get to in the program as well. Remember, you can check out our news 24-7 at privateofficerbreakingnews.blogspot.com as well as going to our news site at privateofficernews.org, our magazine. You can check out our facebook.com forward slash privateofficerinternational and, of course, 24-7, we're on Twitter.com forward slash private officer. So many different ways that you can follow, that you can tag us, that you can be part of what's happening here at Private Officer International. POI will soon celebrate 20 years. We're looking forward to that and another 20 years coming up after that. We are one of the longest existing security associations in the U.S. and probably around the world. If you're not already a member of Private Officer International, all that you have to do is go to privateofficer.org today and sign up. Right now we have a lifetime membership, $99 save, 80 bucks right now, simply by going to privateofficer.org up at the top banner, click on specials, and sign up today. In the program today, we're going to be talking about some upcoming events that you can be part of. We're also taking um, applications for several committee positions. Let me just talk about that for a moment. We need you to participate to make this program better in your area. We offer a lot of different benefits to the security and private law enforcement industries wherever you live, including outside of the U.S., you can participate. You can be part of everything that's happening. Send us an email at helpdesk at privateofficer.com today if you want to get involved. Right now we're taking uh, applications for the Benevolent Committee, where you can assist us in reaching out to those security officers who have been injured or the families and loved ones of those who have been killed in the line of duty and help us to be able to bring support and comfort to those families. We're also taking applications for our award committee, and we have several other committees that you can get involved in. Contact us today at helpdesk at 
PrivateOfficer.com. You can also be involved with Armor College. Go to their website at armorcollege.org. Right now, they're looking for instructors, adjunct instructors, and also campus owners. You can be an owner of a campus. We provide all of the essential training, information, products, front office and back office support. Learn more. Send an email to helpdesk at armor, A-R-M-O-U-R, college.org. If you have done some instructing, if you've been an instructor in different uh, areas and disciplines, and this probably will fit right in with what you've been doing and bring you a substantial income and really give you not only a job, but a lifelong career. Contact Help Desk at Armor, A-R-M-O-U-R, college.org. So much is happening, so much to talk about every week. We really do run out of time. There's so many different areas that we try to cover in one short time span here on the Private Officer Beat Radio. We've been telling you for quite some time about our new upcoming streaming platform, and that date is getting closer and closer and closer. We will soon have a preview of one of the docu-series that will be premiered on our new streaming platform, and that is Missing in Uniform. We told you last week on the program in the news segment, two security officers had gone missing, and they're not the only ones. And in this little preview that we're going to be issuing here soon, you'll see police and security has gone missing both while on duty and after. And, you know, sometimes people do just disappear. They've had it with their life. They've had it with uh, maybe something that's going on at their home or their work, and they just disappear for a while and they come back. Others aren't seen again. And that's what this docuseries is all about, missing in uniform. You won't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. We're going to be previewing that here in just a few weeks. We'll be sending out an email soon about how you can sign up for our brand-new streaming network and see a number of shows, including Breaking Bread, where we sit down and interview public safety and private security and talk about the job and the various aspects We also interviewed recently a U.S. Marshal that was injured in the line of duty, and you'll see that episode as well. If you want to be part of anything happening here at Private Officer, like I have uh, stated so many times, it's easy. It really is. Send an email to helpdesk at privateofficer.com. We're going to take our first quick break. When we come back, we do have a whole lot more to talk about. We have a couple of emails that we do want to answer on the air as well. You can email us at helpdesk at privateofficer.com if you would like to comment on something that you've heard on the radio show or if you would like to ask a question or if you would like to participate on the radio show. Maybe you have a topic of interest that you want to be interviewed for. Maybe that you have some type of training note that you'd like our listeners to uh have knowledge of, contact us at helpdesk at privateofficer.com. Remember, you can listen to all of our radio shows streaming at iHeartRadio. We're on the iHeartRadio platform. You can also listen to any place where you get your podcasts, radio shows, or music, including iTunes, Rhapsody, and the Amazon Music platform and many others we'll be right back here on the private officer beat radio every 40 seconds someone around the world takes their own life every 13 minutes someone in the u.s commits suicide while you were getting ready for work this morning in the first hour of your day 
as many as five people in the U.S. have killed themselves. By lunchtime, about 20 people in the U.S. have taken their own life. At the end of an eight-hour workday, about 40 people in the U.S. killed themselves. In a 24-hour period, as many as 111 people in the U.S. committed suicide. The Federal Aviation Administration wants you to fly your drone responsibly. Avoid flying your drone near other aircraft, especially near airports. Fly your drone below 400 feet. Always keep your drone in sight. If you see a safety issue involving drones, contact local law enforcement immediately. Fly smart. Fly safe. Have fun. This past week, there were three security officer involved fatal shootings. This uh, in and of itself is not really unusual, although to some folks it may seem a little out of the ordinary for private security, but the fact is private security officers are involved in dozens and dozens and dozens of fatal shootings every year. But one of the fatal shootings really caught my attention, and I had to do a little investigation as it was. This happened in the southern part of New Hampshire, in New Boston, New Hampshire. Now, we don't get a lot of security officer activity reports out of New Hampshire. And so when I saw that something had happened in that state, I took particular interest in it, began looking at the particulars that happened. Not a lot of information being shared right now. Um, this happened at the New Boston Space Force Station. Now, on the surface, just the title itself might suggest that it has something to do with the new Space Force that's been added in the recent years. But as I looked into this a little bit further, I found that this was an Air Force facility, and evidently a 33-year-old Massachusetts man entered the property unauthorized, a contract security officer, and a New Boston, New Hampshire police officer confronted the man. There was a shooting, a fatal shooting. According to the police press report, both police officer and contract security officer was involved in the shooting. They both fired at the man. That man has been identified as Michael Foley of Massachusetts, an autopsy um, was performed. It was determined that the cause of death was a single gunshot wound, and his manner of death has been classified as a homicide. Now, this doesn't mean a murder, per se, just that it was not accidental. It was not a natural cause of death. This was... Uh, a death by gunfire. The circumstances at this time is being kept under wraps. Or as they say in law enforcement, it's under investigation. Now, both the police officer and the security officer have been interviewed by a number of law enforcement agencies. If this 
was on the grounds of the facility of the Space Force Station, then more than likely this will be a federal investigation. Uh, the Air Force Law Enforcement Division, probably the FBI or some other federal agency will take the primary um, investigation lead. But really, many other agencies could be involved. Now, from my research, um, this facility is in kind of a rural area, and according to their website, the mission of the U.S. Air Force is to fly, fight, and win air power anytime, anywhere. And this uh, was a training facility of some type, but it also included uh, a command and control center, and several other um, aspects of this particular facility. So it may have been that the man breached security, and the articles does not really allude to whether or not he was armed, although that is uh, a possibility. Um, but it's very unusual, like I said, for a shooting of any type to come out of New Hampshire. Every once in a while, we do pick up on a security officer being assaulted at a, a business of, of some type. But um, like I said, when I saw this particular security officer shooting, um, it really caught my attention. Now, if you're in that New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont area, and you um, see news happening, that is something that we would want to know of. If you see news happening, contact us at helpdesk at privateofficer.com, privateofficer.com anytime 24 7 and um like i said we there's certain areas of the country we just don't see a whole lot of news involving private security coming out of even though we know there are private security personnel there and then of course we have a lot of other areas of the country where we frequently get news out of those areas security officer assaults shootings uh, all sorts of different activities happening. And we invite anyone, whether you're a member or not, to send us that information. If you see something in your area, please let us know. If it involves private security, loss prevention, um, ORC, law enforcement, Anything that our listeners or readers would be interested in, in the security and law enforcement uh, industry, if you know of a security officer that has done something uh, that he should be recognized for, we'd like to know that as well. We want to report the good news, um, and hopefully that will overshadow all of the bad that we have to report. Send that person's name and information to helpdesk at privateofficer.com, helpdesk at privateofficer.com. That's going to be your point of contact, your POC, for almost anything and everything. When it comes into our help desk, they will distribute that email, that information to someone else if it should go through a different channel or be looked at by somebody else within the organization. Uh, or if it should be sent to me personally, they will do that, helpdesk at privateofficer.com. Um, we've talked and talked as well about the virtual museum. We have collected hundreds of pieces of items that we're looking at putting in to the online virtual museum, and it's coming along quite nicely. If you'd like to participate in that project, again, how do you contact us? That's right, help desk at privateofficer.com. We'll be right back here on the Private Officer Beat Radio.
Hey everyone, you're listening to the voice of the Frontline Protector right here on the Private Officer Radio Network. Now don't go away because we are coming right back when we've got a whole lot more right here on the Private Officer Beat Radio. It's on us to stop sexual assault. To get in the way before it happens. To get a friend home safe. And to not blame the victim. It's on us. To look out for each other. To To not not look look the other other way. way. It's on us. To stand up. To step in. To take responsibility. It's on us. All of us. To To stop stop sexual sexual assault. assault. Learn how. And take the pledge at itsonus.org. They've been given a second chance at life through organ and tissue donation. But there are more than 84,000 Americans waiting for life-saving transplants. 17 people die every day, waiting. I didn't know this until I lost my best friend, Lyric. She gave the gift of life to five people. That's why I've become an organ donor, too. One decision saves so many lives. Donate life. Welcome back to this edition of the Private Officer Beat Radio. This is normally where I read a bunch of news, some of the more interesting and um, important news articles of the week. But this week, I have a a topic that I'm going to be talking about that I think is pretty serious. It's in-depth. I'm going to spend more time on this topic segment than I normally would. So today I'm going to just kind of go over a couple of interesting news stories coming, breaking here at the POI News Desk coming into us here in the last few days. But I really encourage you to go to privateofficerbreakingnews.blogspot.com. You can also get that sent directly to you every day. Um, There's a lot of interesting and important news, and as I've said before many times, instructors and training schools and even law enforcement has contacted us over the years, letting us know that they use this information as part of their training. I myself have used news articles numerous times, dozens of times over the years, in my training, in live class, and online. Coming out of Florida, Osceola County, I probably said that incorrectly, Florida deputy is facing criminal charge after using his taser near gasoline, igniting a fire that severely burned a 26-year-old, and also injured the deputy himself and two fellow officers. Over the years, as a taser instructor, I have used articles like this to teach about the importance of avoiding the use of tasers near not only gasoline stations, but in areas where there may be unvented fumes, you don't need gasoline pouring on the ground to ignite a fire. The 
fumes all around the gas pumps are in the air. You don't see them, but they are there. And all that it's waiting for is some source to ignite it. And we've seen other law enforcement use their tasers in the similar situation and causing a major explosion. And one situation that happened in Virginia a number of years ago, the suspect died from his burns. Osceola County Sheriff Marcos Lopez said during a news conference that Deputy David Crawford was placed on paid leave during the internal investigation. He was charged with misdemeanor charges of culpable negligence. This all stemmed from a pursuit and the suspect stopped to get gas. Deputies tried to subdue him, eventually using um, a taser and it ignited a fireball which I have seen other videos similar to it. It's dangerous, folks. If you use a taser, some of the places that you should avoid is any place where there may be some type of vapor, gasoline vapor in the air. I remember a situation uh, at a uh, industrial park where police had cornered a suspect inside a maintenance shed, and the same thing happened there when they used a taser. It exploded a fireball because they had oils and, and gasoline there inside the maintenance shed. Also avoid using the taser on wet grass because you can be shocked. There are many different scenarios where a taser just should not be put into play. And sadly, we see this repeatedly that people don't learn from their training or it just was missed during their training. Coming out of Evansville, Indiana, which is kind of just uh, coincidental because that's where the deputy correction officer from Alabama and the murder suspect who was on the run for about a week was caught. But out of uh, this news story is talking about a brand new police department. And although Evansville has their own city police department and the county has the sheriff's department, a session St. Vincent's Hospital formed their own private police force. And we often talk about how Private police forces and departments are really beginning to expand. Captain Chris Pugh, a retired Evansville police uh, officer, narcotics detective, and SWAT member. He was also the assistant police chief in Evansville before he retired. When he took a new position at the hospital, he decided that they needed to switch from security to their own internal private police force, not only because of better training, but because they would have more access to information, um, police databases and other things, and that it would make their department, their agency much more professional. And so he went about forming that private police department. It is not unheard of in the states where private law enforcement is available, is constitutional, is in the law, that many schools and many hospitals and other types of businesses have formed their own private police department. In Washington, D.C., you cannot go really very far without running into um, a private police department at a hospital, at a school, even the, their own school. In Washington, D.C., a very recognizable religious 
institution called the Washington National Cathedral where many politicians are married and have their funerals. They have their own police force, their own private police force. I think that you're going to continue seeing this private police being instituted in many, many different uh, businesses, hospitals, and schools across the country, and more states allowing it. A very unusual story coming this week, uh, this past week into our office. In Riverside, California, a new police officer is patrolling schools in Coachella, and their main focus is to stop or deter kids from smoking and vaping. And when I read that headline, I had to read the article because I never heard of putting a police officer in school just because of vaping and smoking. The SRO normally enforces that if it, you know he sees it, but to have a special officer. As I read the article and researched it a little bit more, this is a complete campaign they say is detrimental to the student's health. And so this officer, a Riverside County Deputy Sheriff, Alma Fresgozo, is in the school for no other reason but to enforce the smoking and the vaping. Olympia Fields, Illinois, is a security officer, and I do not know if this was a LP agent for Walmart or a contract security officer was uh, critically injured. There was shots fired during an incident. Uh, that security officer hit her head, and she is in critical condition today. I do not know the update, but I do know that um, there was some type of incident. The news flashes that we got um, didn't really say if it was a theft or exactly what, I'm sure that'll be updated and we will uh, look into that later today. Seattle, Washington, uh, private security there all but shut down many businesses as the SEIU-6 union protested and security officers left their jobs. They're protesting because many of them work, are forced to work, they say, up to 16 hours a day and often do not get paid overtime even when they work more than 40 hours. Coming out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the city there has instituted a civilian response team to answer nonviolent calls. Over the last few years, we have seen many police departments go to this model and um, it has worked in some areas and not so well in others. We have seen several civilians injured while responding to these type of calls. Many communities already use community uh, officers, community service officers, and I own a company that offers this type of service as well. And I do believe that we will see this increase. Just recently, two police departments hired civilians to be investigators and to do some of the um, inside investigations as well as go out into the field. They're not sworn law enforcement, but they do a lot of different uh, aspects of investigations. And to wrap up the news in this segment in Riverside, California, Riverside, California pops up quite often. And they must have a lot of stuff happening there. A bus driver and a private security guard at a school have been arrested after they sold fentanyl to special needs students while on campus. Melissa Garrison, 46, and her husband David Garrison, 58, have been charged with possession of controlled substance while armed, illegal possession of a gun, and being a convicted domestic abuser in possession of a firearm. The investigator said that they got anonymous, anonymous tips and began to investigate uh, it seems that the female who was arrested, her mother, actually owns this private school. We're going to be looking into this and tracking um, through our court watch program, our court watch uh, 
We've been doing this for quite a while where we track some cases. We'll be watching this um, quite closely. That wraps up this segment of our news fresh from the news desk here. We're going to come right back. We want to talk today about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I was just going to the grocery store. Seatbelt violators, beware. I forgot to put it on. If you're pulled over because you've broken the law. Oh, it's so uncomfortable. And you're not wearing your seatbelt. It's broken, but I'm going to have it fixed. No matter what your excuse is, you will get a ticket in addition to the ticket for your original violation. Click it or ticket? That's pretty easy to remember. For some children, America isn't the land of promise. It's a place where every day is a struggle. Because today in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. For these children, living in poverty means going without. Going without medicine, going without food, going without a warm home, or even a roof over your head. And that's life for nearly 13 million children of all races all across America. Where will you draw the line and get involved? You can help these children and their families find a way out of poverty for good. And you can make a difference in more ways than you think. Will you help? Go to PovertyUSA.org today. Because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. birthday because I'm a fatal victim of gun violence. My friends, my family, my own mother was devastated. Can't see her son anymore because of gun violence. And everyone's here at the funeral. But before they lay me the rest, there's just one last thing I have to do. How many more of us have to die from gun violence? Let's put a stop to this because if we don't the next time it could be your child lying in this casket. Brought to you by Man Up Inc. USA, a proud member of the gun violence awareness movement. Nine one one telecommunicators are often the unseen heroes of public safety. The public safety cycle starts with the nine one one telecommunicators. So when somebody dials 911, the 911 telecommunicator is receiving information, getting help dispatched to the correct place, and then providing potentially life-saving advice until the paramedics, the police, or the firefighters uh, arrive. My name is Stephanie Venturelli. I'm a 911 telecommunicator. We answer 911 calls throughout the community, and dispatch the police and fire department for where they need to go. I knew I wanted to do something in the public safety field. I wanted to help people, but I didn't necessarily want to run into fires or be fighting criminals. So I focused on the emergency management field and then found my way into dispatching, which is really fits perfectly. I'm helping people. Harvard College is excited to announce our brand new public safety dispatcher program. This 18 week program will get you ready to take the required exam to become a telecommunicator for police, fire, or EMS. Check out the brand new program at armorcollege.org. Start your new career today. Driving a car is basically like driving a weapon. My friend died because someone made a bad driving decision. 
My uncle died because someone didn't think before they got behind the wheel. You let down your parents and your loved ones. You could lose your friends. Parents don't like their kids hanging out with criminals. Drug driving is just as bad as drunk driving. Welcome back, everyone, to this edition of the Private Officer Beat Radio. Uh, Today, I do want to spend a little bit of time here in the last portion of this program talking about a subject that I spent a considerable amount of time toward the end of last year and, again, early this year, researching for a special curriculum and program that I wrote for first responders. This program is essential for anyone and everyone who deals with the public on a daily basis. And while I cannot give you the totality, the total program, in the limited amount of time that I have left in this radio program, I would like to talk for a few moments about the importance of mental health education for first responders. One of the areas that I spent a considerable amount of time researching and a topic that I am familiar with, I have worked with, but I know, as with most training, things are updated, changed, uh, new additives uh, are put in to the education process. And so today I want to talk a little bit about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, many people believe that that's just something for those military members who are coming back from uh, being in a war zone or maybe someone who worked on a site such as the 9-11 tragedy in New York City, or maybe it's just something that um, frontline workers occasionally experience because of the daily, daily observations and situations that they're involved in. Now, for years, there have been many discussions about really what PTSD really is and who it affects and how to classify it. Is it a mental health illness? Is it just some type of um, one time and done, or is it a reoccurrence? And while many people over the years have just wanted it to be considered a medical condition, the truth is that it is a mental health disorder. And as I studied the deeper complexity of this subject and the many areas of the mental health disorders that are often connected to PTSD, I realized that while there was training out there, while there was mental health assistance out there for those frontline workers and military personnel, veterans, there really wasn't much out there specifically for work-related PTSD. Of course, there's mental health facilities across the country that you can go into. PTSD may not be curable, although it is at times, but it is treatable. 
and there are still many unknowns about the subject. There's much to be learned because the brain is complex, and of course there continues to be many things that we just don't understand about PTSD. But let me explain something, and this was not surprising. In looking at what is available, what treatment is available, what treatment centers are available across the country, I knew that there was not going to be much consideration or even any specific treatment or even much of an acknowledgement that security officers are part of those frontline workers and should be treated as a first responder. And like I said, no surprise here that I didn't really come across many trade articles, news articles, news reports, or other data relating to the security field. However, I did come across a couple of things that private officer have put out over the years, and I also came across a story, a news article, um, dating back to 9-11 that did put security personnel in the mix of being first responders, per se, and dealing with the after effects of the tragedy. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder in which a person has difficulty recovering after experiencing or witnessing a terrifying event. This condition, it might last a few months, it could be years, with triggers that can bring back these memories of trauma accompanied by intense emotional and physical reactions, and it might happen just like that. You could be driving down the street, and I know from my own life experiences that this has happened, not thinking about anything specific, and all of a sudden, the video of our mind comes on, and it begins to play something that we experienced, that we saw, that was intense that was traumatic, out of nowhere. Some of the symptoms associated with PTSD includes nightmares. You've seen it in the movies where they suddenly wake up or they're screaming or they have these reoccurring nightmares or unwanted memories of the trauma. I don't think that you necessarily would have PTSD if, if your memory brings back something that happened to you, but if it's reoccurring all the time, if it prevents you from sleeping, if it prevents you from working, if it interferes with your life, then you need to seek treatment. Symptoms also include the avoidance. Avoidance of situations <clears throat> that bring back the memories of the trauma. In other words, if something happened to you at a certain location or something happened to you at a certain maybe time of the year, you avoid it. You don't want anything to do with it. Or maybe it involved a specific person and you avoid them and you cut them off and you want nothing more to do with them, especially in cases of sexual assaults. There are many signs and symptoms of PTSD, and there are many associated triggers that bring back certain 
memories. Nightmares, unwanted memories of the trauma, avoidance of situations or persons that bring back memories of a trauma, heightened reactions, anxiety, or depressed moods are some associated symptoms of this disorder. This is not the individual's fault, and I want to make that clear. Many frontline workers, many employees experience PTSD because of job-related incidents, situations, and trauma that they've been exposed to, some over and over and over again. Many first responders, and I'm putting security in the mix, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, military, often see gruesome incidents, devastating situations, shocking incidents. And our minds and our bodies experience this over and over, and it could and sometimes often does lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people don't realize it, or if they do, they don't acknowledge it. Some people experience or develop PTSD after experiencing a shocking, scary, or dangerous event, and oftentimes that's related to work but not always. The good news is that PTSD is treatable. As a medical professional myself, I have responded to many of these situations. I have experienced it myself. I understand that this doesn't have to be permanent. I understand that we don't want to acknowledge mental health disorders or PTSD, but it's real and we need help. According to a recent study, about six out of every 100 people or 6% of the population will have PTSD at some point in their lives. About 12 million adults in the U.S. have PTSD during any given year. In a 2014 study involving 3,157 U.S. veterans, 87% reported exposure to at least one traumatic event. On average, veterans reported 3.4 potentially traumatic events during their lifetime. In 2015, the report stated that it was estimated that 30% of first responders develop behavioral health conditions, including but not limited to depression and post-traumatic stress disorder as compared with 20% in the general population. As with the general population, it is suspected that tens of thousands of other first responders, including law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, and private security, live every day with undiagnosed or unmanaged PTSD. Many suffer emotionally, psychologically, and physically because of it. Now, during my research, because this was directed to first responders, I wanted to know what the current numbers, what the percentage of firefighters and law enforcement that have this disorder. And so I did some research. I had some old figures from years ago. 
I wanted to see if the numbers had gone up or gone down. And as suspected, they'd gone up. Research shows that 20% of all firefighters in the nation and other first responders pass the diagnostic threshold for PTSD at some point in their career in comparison with only 6.8% of the general population. Other people not involved in firefighting, 6.8% and 20% or more for firefighters and first responders. A higher number of first responders experience symptoms that do not meet the full diagnostic criteria for PTSD. And what that means is they are suffering to some degree of PTSD. They just aren't 100% there. I looked at the same information for law enforcement. It is estimated that on average, approximately 15% of police officers in the U.S. experience PTSD. And according to the Department of Justice, a study that they recently did, PTSD can and does interfere with an officer's critical thinking. I'm putting security in the same category because we have to make split-second decisions just like law enforcement oftentimes. And unfortunately, we don't make good decisions many times. It is important for us to understand the serious nature of this disorder. Yes, it has a stigma attached to it because it is a mental health illness, but it's curable, it's treatable, it's manageable. Police officers are often exposed to traumatic events, according to this DOJ study. Seeing abused children, dead bodies, severe assaults, being involved in shootings, and coming under attack themselves, and therefore are, are at a higher risk for PTSD than other professions. The potential long effects, long-term effects of PTSD in police officers and security personnel and others on the front line additionally lead to behavioral dysfunction, such as substance abuse. I myself, I can testify because of my exposure to many officers over the years, I have never, fortunately and thankfully, was in that category, but other, other long-term effects of this illness is abuse, abusing people, your spouse, your friends, aggression, and that aggression can play out oftentimes while you're in the performance of your duties, and sadly, it also leads to suicide. Firefighters, EMTs and paramedics, and yes, even security officers. We have noticed here at POI that security officers often suffer undiagnosed PTSD after being involved in a shooting incident. During the 9-11 attacks, there were many security officers killed, and there were many security officers that worked that scene, that terrible, unbelievable World Trade Center after the collapse. We 
with more than 18,000 security officers being seriously injured and 140 plus being killed every year, there are definitely, definitely a lot of PTSD out there undiagnosed. It is something that employers need to consider. It is something that individual security officers need to think about. In this short time that I have to talk about this, I'm not even scratching the surface. I'm not even beginning to explain the seriousness of this. And this doesn't just have to do with frontline workers. Bethany Ann was just seven years old when two armed gunmen broke into her home, robbed and shot her parents, killing her mother and sexually assaulting her oldest sister, while Bethany Ann watched. Although the men were caught, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison, the violent, senseless events of that day was permanently burned into her mind and in her soul, and they never faded away. Fifty years later, in a lifetime of counselors and therapists and other professionals, Bethany Ann's trauma that she suffers every day is still as raw and real as when it happened. And while tra trying to maintain some type of normalcy, Bethany Ann got a college degree, got married, had children of her own, but she often suffered from depression, anxiety, and occasional thoughts of suicide. And in 2020, she lost her battle with post-traumatic stress disorder and committed suicide at her mother's grave. Even after you get help, even after years and and so much time goes by, it's still there. We can try to push it away. We can try to ignore it. We can try to say it doesn't exist. It doesn't affect us. But we know that it does. And in closing, I'd like for you to think about this. Workplace injuries and deaths are a key factor in the onset of many of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Workplace injuries and deaths, it doesn't say just for first responders. In the United States, private industry employers, those that are not part of the government, reported 2.7 million non fatal workplace injuries and illnesses in 2020. 2.7 million non-fatal workplace injuries and illnesses in 2020. Now, the good thing, that was down from 2.8 million. So there was a million less in 2019. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, even at this rate, this equates to 7,000 397 workplace injuries every day. Every single day, over 7,000 employees are injured on the job. Additionally, in 2020, 4,764 U.S. workers died on the job, an average of 13 deaths per day, and the equivalent of one worker dying every 111 minutes. That's one worker dying every day, every two hours or less. Many of these injuries and deaths were traumatic in nature. They weren't just cuts and bruises. They weren't just, oh, they passed out and died. These were traumatic, serious injuries. 2.7 million. This should give you pause. This 
should give you great concern, especially if you are an employer, a business owner. You may not realize it. You may not think about it. You may not ask about it. You may not even acknowledge the possibility that people in your employment are suffering from PTSD. In the security industry, we don't give a crap much about our employees overall. The security industry is not one to coddle or even try to reach out and check on their people after situations. We know, we know that thousands of security officers are injured violently every year. We know that more now than ever before, they're facing more gun violence, that they're being assaulted as they take on newer roles more closely associated with law enforcement. We know that they're seeing death, injury, violence regularly and almost daily depending on their assignment and where they're working. Are we giving them treatment? Are we helping them? Are we pointing them in the direction where they can get help? I doubt it. PTSD for security officers is as real as it is for law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics and any other first responder. Isn't it about time to not only step up and say, yes, this is definitely a problem. It's definitely affecting my employee. This is something I need to do something I I need to help them with. Isn't this time that we really start caring more about our employees than about the bottom line? I would ask that you send this audio today to as many coworkers, to your employer as possible because this is serious business. And the tragedy of this is, we know that suicides among private security has gone up substantially in the last 10 to 15 years. In closing, let me just say this. About five years ago, we talked to a clinical specialist, mental health specialist, specifically about security. And he stated that this is an area of first responders. And his exact words were, that is being ignored, being ignored. Purposely or otherwise, many are aware of this problem, suicides. In 2018, we tracked 13 security officers commit suicide, most on the job. We had one in downtown Washington, D.C. several years ago who blew his head off on the rooftop of the building that he was working at. We had another security officer just earlier this year at a government post that killed himself at the front gate. Much of this is to do with PTSD, with the things that they're experiencing and seeing and have little to no help dealing with it, getting the treatment. It's time, folks. We need to step up and step out. We need to unite together and confront this issue, both the suicide and the PTSD head on. It's time. That's going to conclude this edition of the Private Office for Beat Radio. Thank you for being here. Remember, be blessed, be safe, and we'll see you back here on the radio.